count of three when children open the shoe boxes, they're so excited. I mean, it's just been incredible. Kids are so excited, giving them a gift, do it in Jesus' name, and that's what this is all about. Jesus loves you. It's a gospel opportunity. It's the chance for the children to change the entire life. The Word of God is spreading. The gospel is advancing. It is impacting children. It is impacting families. It is impacting the world greatly. Thank you for praying. Thank you for giving. God will bless, and God will use your gift to touch the life of a child and to be able to do it in Jesus' name. So thank you. Thank you for being a part of it. God bless each and every one of you.
Good morning and welcome to our worship service this morning. Today is Remembrance Day Sunday, so after call to worship, we will have a ceremony. Uh, last Sunday, we had our first Zoom Holy Communion, so please join us for next time. Uh, also, to please join us for Zoom Copy Hour after the service. It will start at 11 o'clock. Please join me now in the call to worship. Eternal God, your people praise your name. We tell of your glorious deeds. Infinite God, your people marvel at your majesty. We tell of your grace and power. Everlasting God, your people give thanks for your saving love. We tell of the wonders you have done. So let us worship our God of justice and peace and pray for God's reign among us.
Let us pray. God, our Creator and Redeemer, in this solemn season of remembrance, we are aware of how much war has caused the world your love. In spite of fighting between nations and neighbors, you have come to us in Jesus Christ, carrying no sword, calling us to serve as peacemakers. In this time of worship, renew in us the hope that you will turn our swords into plowshares and lead the world from the study of war to the promise of peace with justice for all your peoples. God of mercy, we confess that the world around us is in a mess. Countries turn arguments over territory into ter threats of terror. All the enemies stir up conflict within their tribes and nations. The threat of violence keeps us all on edge. Forgive us for not learning from past conflicts what leads to peace with justice. Forgive us when you want to settle our own disagreements by keeping conflict alive. We pray all these in Jesus' name, and we pray as He taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And Christ died so that we might live. Through his undying love, we have been forgiven. Rejoice in the forgiveness God offers us. Be at peace with God and yourself, and make peace with your neighbors for Christ's sake. Amen. Good morning, the boys and girls. Uh, do you know what this uh, flower is called? It is a poppy. The poppy serves as a reminder that this week we will celebrate a very important holiday. So how many of you know what holiday we will celebrate? We will celebrate Remembrance Day. Uh, Remembrance Day is a day on which we honor the men and women who have served in the military and who have fought to defend our freedom. Uh, the poppy was chosen as a symbol for Remembrance Day because it reminds us of a place called Flanders Fields where many soldiers from the First World War are buried. The poppies grow wild there between all the crosses that mark their place. So we enjoy a lot of freedom. We are free to come to church and worship. We are free to choose what we want to be when we grow up. We are free to choose where we want to live. We are free to choose most of the things that affect our daily lives. Now, this might come as a surprise to some of you, but did you know that freedom isn't free? Someone had to pay the price for us to have the freedom that we enjoy. There are many men and women who have helped to pay that price. Some have served in the military, and many of them have fought in wars. There are probably some people here this morning who had loved ones who, have, who gave their lives fighting for our freedom. These are the ones that we honor as we celebrate Remembrance Day. We have a lot of freedom, but the greatest freedom that we have is the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. The Bible teaches that the penalty for sin is death, but you and I have been set free from this penalty. We have been set free because Jesus paid the penalty. The Bible tells us that Jesus died so set us free from the penalty of sin. So instead of death, we have been given eternal life. This freedom wasn't free. Jesus paid the price. So this week, as we celebrate Remembrance Day, 
let us remember to stop and thank God for those who have paid the price for our freedom. Let us also remember to thank God for Jesus, who has set us free from the penalty of sin, because he was willing to pay the price. Let us pray. Dear Father, thank you for the freedom that we enjoy. We are thankful for those who paid the price for that freedom. But even more important, we thank you for the freedom we have because Jesus was willing to pay the penalty for our sin. Amen. First reading is Amos chapter 5, verse 18 to 24. Ho to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion only to meet a bear. As though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wall, only to have a snake bite him. Will not the day of the Lord be dark? Darkness, not light, pitch dark without a ray of brightness. I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. You bring me choice fellowship offerings. I have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your hearts. But let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to 18. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of a mannequin who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, who will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel and a trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and also will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 to 13. At the time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet their bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all of the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet. And the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. This is the word of the Lord. Oh, we are approaching the end of the Christian year. Uh, as always, the Gospel lessons focus on the end of things and the return of Jesus. And this is the time for us to take seriously 
the message that one day Jesus will return. Our job is to be ready. Uh, today's gospel story tells us about ten bridesmaids who are waiting to meet the bridegroom. In typical Jewish marriage customs, a bridegroom left his parents' home with his friends to go to the home of the bride, where the ceremony would take place. Then there would be a wedding banquet at the home of the bride. The wedding would often be held at night and last for a week. What a party! The task of the bridesmaids was to welcome the bridegroom when he arrived. The ten bridesmaids await a bridegroom's arrival when the wedding festivities will begin at last. But the wait proves to be difficult, as it usually is for people with high expectations. It lasts deep into the night. The ten who wait look almost identical, except for one detail. All are bridesmaids, all were invited, all want to see the bridegroom and join the party. All wait into the night. Even the five wise bridesmaids fall asleep too. Only one difference separates the two groups. Some, those described as wise, were prepared for the bridegroom's absence. And these five took pains to do what was necessary while the bridegroom remained away, symbolized by their surplus lamp oil. The others, the foolish ones, are exposed when they find their lamps empty at the big moment. And because they did not bother to equip themselves to wait the right way, they will not be equipped to share the party with Jesus, the bridegroom, when he becomes present. Uh, this parable about ten bridesmaids characterizes Christianity as a waiting religion. Awaiting the fullness of the kingdom of God, Jesus promised, Christians hope for new realities to come into existence. Christian faith involves waiting with confidence. And this was a live issue for the first readers of the Matthew's Gospel. The first generation or two of Christians expected Christ's return to be imminent. They fully expected it to happen in their lifetime. And when it didn't, there was some concern, some questions, some doubts even. Had they been wrong? Had they given their lives over to a lie? Were they here suffering and enduring for nothing? Was there no end in sight? Was the bridegroom coming at all? These days, I'm not sure how much the imminence of Christ's return factors into our decision-making. I'll have to say, it's not much of a motivating factor for us. Not that it's not important. Of course it is. Jesus said that he will return just as surely as he said he would be crucified, buried, and resurrected on the third day. The parable of the bridesmaids ends with a wedding. It ends in celebration and joy. The wedding feast is our ideal, our goal, our destination. Without it, we have no standard, no accountability, nothing to lean into, nothing to work towards, nothing to anticipate as we labor in God's name. So we dare not abandon this glorious ending simply because we've grown tired of waiting. 
If the bridesmaids, both the foolish ones and the wise, or prudent ones, represent the church today, how ready are we followers of Jesus for his return? What does ready or having enough oil look like almost 2,000 years after Jesus died and rose again, promising to return one day? but not saying when. The wisdom here, the mark of preparedness, is to be ready for the long haul. The five of the young women had sense enough then, as Thomas Long puts it, not to be ready for the groom, but for the groom's delay. The wise ones in the church Hold on to the faith deep into the night, long right, and even though they see no bridegroom coming, still hope and serve and pray and wait for the promised victory of God. Waiting is simply the reality of life. Not that we should say, this is how it is, get over it but that what we choose to utter or how we choose to be in the waiting matters. In the meantime, there is work to be done. There is a great, big, beautiful, broken world out there, brimming with people who need to know about God's love and filled with possibility for mission and ministry. For one thing, I'd like to make it through this troubling season we are in as a people. Of anxiety, and violence, and fear, and polarity, with a sense of wholeness. Every day brings a new outrage, a new scandal, a new seemingly strong case for despair. It will suck the life out of us if you let it. And I confess, I often do. On top of that, there is so much need, not even in the world, but in our community. So many struggling, so many looking for relief and support. How can we keep the light on for them as a church? Despite Jesus' absence, despite the presence of circumstances that conspire to rob us of wakefulness and hope, Christians express expectation. They anticipate. So one way to understand this time is to think of it as preparation. What we do with our faith and our lives right now will influence our readiness for Jesus. And so we pass, we pass faith along to our children. We rely upon one another and upon the best of our traditions to sustain us when doubt and fatigue prove overwhelming. We forgive one another's sins, study scriptures, baptize people into a new identity, and share a meal to recognize the sustenance God provides. These things aren't mere rituals or time fillers. They sustain us in Jesus' absence when the hazards of nighttime, fatigue, and resignation confront us all. They promote readiness. But Matthew's Gospel, including Jesus' troublesome parables, will not allow us to neglect another dimension of this waiting. Living with deferred hope also prompts us to consider others who experience unfulfillment or absence in their own lives, especially absence of opportunity absence of justice, or absence of hope. And so, faithfulness must also consist in serving those who are poor, 
oppressed and outside. It involves working for reconciliation. It's up to us to live in a way so that we are always prepared. Quite honestly, living a life in which we are always prepared is easy. All we have to do, all we are asked to do by God is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Thanks be to God. Amen. This time of lessened activity has been a good time for reflection and meditation on the things that matter. What has struck me is the impermanence of things. The bumper sticker once said, whoever dies with the most toys wins. But I believe that bumper sti sticker is trumped by the one that says, whoever dies with the most toys dies. When we really think about it, everything is impermanent. Toys, buildings, churches, friends, even our own bodies, which will eventually sicken and decay and fail us. There's only one thing that has real permanence, that is our relationship with Jesus Christ and our decision to follow or not to follow him. In Matthew 6, 19 to 20, Jesus tells us that we shouldn't build up our treasures on things that are impermanent, but on those that last eternally. Such is the work of God's people. Such is the work of God's people at Centennial that continues despite our not gathering together at 103 Pinetown Place. Our expenses continue. The bills still need to be paid. The fact that we are not seeing each other face to face does not in any way lessen our needs. Please remember your commitment to God and to Centennial as you prepare your offering. A reminder of the three ways you can give will appear on the screen. Details are on our website. Let us prepare to give.
Let us pray. Generous and gracious God, we have received so much from you in Christ and in creation. Bless the gifts we offer this day, so they will speak of your love for the world in all its detail, and for people in all our diversity. May our gifts touch the need around us in the name of Christ, who makes us one. Amen. Thanks again for joining our worship service this morning. Hope to see you next week. I close our worship in benediction now, so let us pray. My friends, no matter how reluctant we might be to serve, be assured that we do not serve alone. No matter how dim we feel our light may be, know that we shine brighter because we go forth with the light of Christ. Remember that no matter where we go or what we do, we do so with the certainty that God has called us by name and we are His. Go forth, therefore, in the love, grace, and peace of God, through Christ our Lord. Amen.